Hello, Survivors. Welcome to the State of Decay 2 stream. I'm your host, Jeffrey Card, and uh, we've got another interesting stream for you. Uh, this is not the stream where we're going to be announcing a bunch of brand new stuff for the game. Uh, you've been waiting for a really big stream with a really big announcements, and this isn't that one. Uh, but this is still going to be a pretty cool stream. Uh, if you're, I should say, though, um, just right up front, if you do, if you are in the market for information on upcoming Xbox games or upcoming updates to Xbox games, things like that, uh, there's another show you should be checking out. Uh, this week on Xbox, hosted by Major Nelson. Uh, if you go to any of the channels that you're on, and it's like slash Xbox, that's where it is. It's Fridays, 9 a.m. Pacific time. That's a really good place to go. Um, we'll be watching this week. I think you might want to, too. But we're not going to do anything big and fancy right now, except for meet this guy. This is Brian Giammi. Hi. He is a senior systems designer and also spreadsheet wizard. Uh, here. I appreciate that you have both of those titles in there. Oh, I'm ready to go. <laughs> so Brian has uh, sort of braved the waters of his own basement to get here. <laughs> and uh, we'll have to tell you about that later, yeah. probably. It's true. Uh, and so, so he's our guest, uh, and we are going to be sharing a, uh, a video. Also, Brant is here. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about Brant in a second. Pfft, everyone knows Brant. Who cares? Uh, it's true. <laughs> so we've got this uh, Dev Diary video. We were actually making uh, a whole set of Dev Diary videos for some reason. Uh, we didn't have this one planned, but Brian uh, is so mesmerizing whenever he's talking about a spreadsheet uh, that we ended up sort of hacking together a new one. And uh, we're going to get to know that one really soon. I find Brian mesmerizing just sitting here. <laughs> I, I often mesmerize without meaning to. It's a problem. <laughs> it makes my life very complicated. So as we said... I think, uh, I think it's charming. Aw. As, as we said, Brant Fitzgerald is also yeah, here. Yeah. He's our whatever. He's, he's going to be driving the game, though. So while Brant is getting the game ready to go, uh, let me tell you about one other thing. So under here, under the desk, I've got this, yeah. this item. This is a T-Rex espresso. <laughs> what, what are you doing? Brian. <laughs> Brian's trying to get on the camera. We got a T-Rex Espresso t-shirt. This is, again, like last week, we've got a last-of-its-kind t-shirt that we're giving away. Uh, it's large size, so bear that in mind. But if you want to have this one-of-a-kind t-shirt, uh, type exclamation point enter into the chat. Let me bring up the chat so I can actually see you guys talking. Uh, exclamation point enter. That's how you, uh, you know, get into this giveaway. And at about... 3.45 Pacific time, you know, 43 minutes from now, uh, we're going to be declaring a winner. Now, last week, we had a different t-shirt up for grabs. A another one of a kind. Yep. Another one of a kind t-shirt. The Fork in the Road Diner. Uh, we still have it because Lil Roscoe 25, who was the winner, never got into contact with us. Lil Roscoe 25, get in touch with us. So, yeah, Lil Roscoe 25, if you're out there, uh, send an email to social at undeadlabs.com because we need to hear from you to get you this shirt. If you don't in the next week, we're going to give this shirt away again to somebody else. So please get in contact with us. We want to give you your stuff. So with all of that figured out, uh, let's actually get to the game. So, Brant. What am I doing? I th why don't we play our nightmare, uh, our nightmare group? Great. The one that we started last week. Unless you want to go over to the New Society, that also Here we works. go. He survived zero whole days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's see how far we can go. It's brand new because we actually did like a full community wipe last time. So... I'm going to assume that was completely on purpose and exactly the plan. So while we're getting into the game, Brian, can you explain what your job is? You are a spreadsheet wizard, a sure. senior systems designer. Go for it. So the simple way to explain this is if there's a number in the game that you don't like, uh, that's my fault. That I would not go that far. <laughs> no, it's not quite no, that No, no, no. Go ahead. It's just actually... Always, just like channel all of your all discontent of in this general direction. <laughs> Uh, so my job is generally to try and keep all the sort of gears that turn in State of K2 working together in the right way um, so that the right difficulty comes from the right place, the right reward comes from the right place. You want items that feel good for the level of challenge you had to sort of experience to earn them. Uh, you want to build something in your base and it's supposed to help you by the right amount for the cost. So getting all that stuff right is sort of where I live. So like tuning the cost to build facilities and how effective all the buffs are and so figuring out where the numbers are in morale or how often uh, you'll get injured or not from getting attacked by zombies and how expensive it is to fix all of that. Uh, today we're going to do a lot of talking about uh, loot specifically. I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the stuff you find in the world is appropriate for the context of the apocalypse, appropriate for the location you're in, appropriate for the difficulty you've selected, and appropriate for the sort of gameplay choices that you've been making. 
and that the total amount of stuff that's available makes sure that you're sort of on your toes, but that you can get out ahead of it if you're clever and you're thoughtful about how you play. It sounds like your job is to make a system that can play five-dimensional chess with the player's expectations. I, <laughs> you're not wrong. It feels, it feels kind of like I've made the worst Sudoku puzzle of all time sometimes. <laughs> yeah. and we're just trying to make all these pieces fit and get everything to add up and then go, ta-da, look, it's perfect. Um, and so it's, it's an ongoing process, but we've... Then we've been keeping things in hand for a couple years. So we got a pretty specific question from Jim Struckman Jr. Sure. Why do you get bandages in gas cans? <laughs> so there's a specific thing that can cause that. Uh, if you have looted all of the gas cans that you're supposed to from the map, like we don't want you to find any more fuel because that region is just running out of fuel, and the game has turned on a gas can container, there's a behavior called fallback loot, where in emergencies where you're, you've completely drained the map of its supply, it'll try and put stuff that is broadly appropriate into some containers, uh, and there are some containers where that system sort of feels a little bit silly, where you get bandages. Uh, we actually have some stuff in the pipe for somewhere in the future. I don't know when we're going to get mm -hmm. to, to get that out the door. We have to get some QA time on it that actually surgically replaces weird loot in containers with better backup loot for those containers. So oh, it's more container specific instead of having just everything's pulling from the same yeah. general. So we got, pool. we got a small upgrade to that system because when we first wrote it, we were thinking this would be probably fine most of the time, and we had to ship the game. And that's one of the things that we've sort of come and look into when we had a few minutes to spare somewhere, and said, all right, well that obviously doesn't feel quite right for like a gas can. Um, you people find. Uh, was the chemical tanks also had a sort of a similar issue? So I always imagined that it was a gas can that was uh, you know somebody used it a little bit, and then they just stuffed a bandage inside the <laughs> nozzle. <laughs> To keep the fumes from coming out, you know, keep it from evaporating. Right. Or whatever. I like his answer a lot better. Let's go to Jeffrey's answer. <laughs> That's how you end up with um, uh, potato, chip, potato chips oh. in, in, in in gas cans because that's where I like. You to actually keep use them. them as a fuel filter. No you pour one, the gas. No one and the will salt eat in the chips. Pulls the impurities out. No of the one gas. will eat your chips if <laughs> they've been in stored in a gas can. I would I would not be surprised if that's like a real thing you could actually do. Also, would also be surprised at the same time. That's true. <laughs> Let me, uh... This guy doesn't even know what's about to happen. That's why we call it stealth. Hello! <laughs> oh, I just barely noticed that uh, Megan told me to hold on the contest uh, until she had it ready to go. Oh, but it looks like to... uh, it is ready to go now. So uh, if you... Uh, I believe... I think I saw some notifications come by from Bautissimo that the, uh, the exclamation point enter thing is working. So if you did just barely join us, we are doing a giveaway throughout this stream up until about 3.45 where we're giving away this t-shirt, this one-of-a-kind t-shirt, last one left of its type. Uh, it's a large. You just got to hit exclamation point enter uh, to get uh, get in there. And at 345, we'll make a random determination. And we're staring at a screamer. I think I should let you talk about that. I was that. just going to say that this is what happens if you don't floss your teeth. Oh, my God. <laughs> Gingivitis is serious. You mean Brant sneaks up behind Fall you and knifes ninjas. you in the face That's is what how happens. That works. I don't know if insurance covers that. I should, you know, my, we, we just barely got our children new toothbrushes uh, to try to motivate them to brush their teeth because it is really, really hard to build those kinds of habits. Uh, yes. I, I finally learned how to do it when I was like 27. Oh, I started so. flossing like maybe two years ago and a dentist <laughs> said, your options are pay me more money for a more expensive kind of cleaning or floss. And yeah. you know, I was like, "Oh, okay, I'll listen now." I like swear by my Sonic toothbrush now. It's like it's like a Sonic screwdriver. It does like miracle things in For your, your face. face. Yes. So if I, you want a screwdriver in your face, <laughs> there you go. That's what I'm Who talking knew about. That you would get this kind of advice on this stream. Only, hey. only here. We oral care. This is, labs we stream. care about your oral hygiene. Yeah. Hello, survivors. Welcome to the oral hygiene stream. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah, so Dunedade says, my existing T-Rex Presso shirt is getting holy. I need a new one. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> well, you're one of the few that actually has one. I don't even have one. Do, do, yeah, I don't even, do yeah, I don't even have one of these. Do we have them? I don't think we have those. I don't think any of us got those. those. Are, those yeah, are just for you. These are very, you very special. special than we are. <laughs> yeah, there was a very short time when Microsoft, when the store we had set up, yep. produced those things. Uh, Free Dragon 87 was curious what uh, platform we're playing the game on. We're playing this on a on an Xbox One X right now. Uh, so yet usually when we come to our streams, uh, we're, we're playing on an Xbox One X we've got here set up in the office. Just a normal retail kit, nothing special about it. When we've got to show stuff that is unreleased, uh, we used to use a PC that was a piece of garbage. 
And uh, if we had a few streams that were just completely ruined by uh, that PC just conking out on us. Jeffrey actually hated that PC. Yeah, it's actually, it's still over there, and I occasionally kick it whenever I I just come in here and I kick it when it has I'm a different a different job mad. now. Yeah, it's, it's a different PC. job. Yeah, uh, but uh, but no. So we've got a uh, we've now we've got uh, an Xbox One X dev kit in here. So mm -hmm. that's what we're, we're going to be using um, on any future streams where we got to show unreleased content. So that's that's what you get. So we're basically always playing this on console. We want you to see, you know, a lot of our players uh, play the game on the Xbox One, and so we really want, uh, you know, to be sharing with folks, you know, the experience that they're really going to be having, rather than getting some kind of like amazing super machine in here that makes the game look ten times as good as uh, as, as most of the, the hardware folks have out there. We should we should play on on stuff that's really in people's homes. Um, so Fred Garvin is asking, what is the biggest spreadsheet I've made for the game? Uh, you will find out oh. in approximately five minutes. Yeah. yeah, I've been doing this for about a decade now, and I've made a few. Uh, this is a doozy. <laughs> yeah, it's like the, the, the whole thing about, you know, five-dimensional chess. I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like the, 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 it's tr three. You're, you're trying to show so many Ooh, different what, things what in yeah. the same spreadsheet. Like the, the trick is to make sure that no one thing is making the other systems seem silly or fake. Yeah. Plus, the, once we had a dread and nightmare, uh, we basically said, all right, that work we already did, let's just do it two more times. Yeah. And then everything always has to have all three of those locked up at the same time. Hellhound1 asks, is there a limit to how many clothes you can find per map playthrough? think about that. I believe the answer is yes. There's a certain amount of drops that are guaranteed, so we could figure the data to where, I don't remember the exact amount, but some fraction of the houses you find are guaranteed to drop clothing. Um, some amount of military sites are guaranteed to drop clothing, and there's also a sort of grab bag pool. So we want to make sure that we have a uh, variable experience, but that it should be consistent to some degree. Yeah. And so one system makes sure that if you keep looting houses, you will find stuff, and the other system says, sometimes you should just get lucky, and you'll get two in a row. So, but, but it eventually a adds up per map. So you'll eventually, if you've exhausted a map and you move maps, there should be more on the new map. Yeah, and 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 the question of you know not being able to get every single outfit on a single run, as we continue to add outfits to the pool, the uh, the limits don't change. Right. And so and so eventually, you know, as we keep adding outfits, the outfits, the number of available outfits will far outstrip uh, the, the, the 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 available right. per playthrough. But if you've been playing along the entire time, we're just sort of refilling. You're close that gap. What can happen? Now, outfits are interesting, and in unlike all the other loot in the game, when you get one, it adds to your account and we can't drop that one again, right? So that doesn't, that's not how Band-Aids work or guns work. I can give you two M4s, 12 Band-Aids, six gas cans, that's fine. Yeah. Can't give you two bomber hats. You got the bomber hat, you have it forever. And yeah. so there's some, or at least not two bomber hats of the same color. Right, right, we actually do have like a variety of different bomber hats. <laughs> Specifically <laughs> But a particular true. one, yeah. Right, um, so we can't give you that one twice. What we do is we try to re-roll against the table from which the bomber hat came. And if you've gotten everything that could have dropped there, then it won't necessarily do anything. Uh, we have at least one R&D thing out there to try and see if there's a more clever way to do that, where if you got all the hats you could have ever gotten from here and there weren't any more hats to give you, can we, like, tell the system about other hats that are related? But that's... It's a complicated enough system already, and every time you do something like that, it gets harder to test and harder to ship stuff on time. And so we have to be really careful about trying to sort of get too smart for our own good. Yeah, like, so we like, have a balance to strike between how much we guarantee stuff will happen here and how much we make it easy for us to make sure it's all working. Because, like, because for instance, when we uh, launched the Choose Your Own Apocalypse update, which included the, the three difficulty zones, yeah, uh, that add that basically tripled the workload. Like, if we were to ever, you know, like, uh, you know, create a new map or something like that, it would triple the workload so that you know you don't just have to make one. Loot table. No, you have to you do the entire three map loot three tables. times. Yep. Yeah. And so every time you add a new feature, add new new complexity, you you run the risk unless you are being very careful about it. You run the risk of increasing not just not just doing the work of building that feature, but increasing all of your future work because every time you change something new, you got to go back and account for all of the new things you've added. Yep. Later. So the more we add, the more it takes to keep adding more. Uh, so JW wants to know what weapon is Brant using? Also, Brant has gotten some positive reviews for the amount of focus on his face right now as he's playing the game. Oh, he's playing a nightmare. I'm, he's not I'm, dying. I'm so bad at nightmare. I have to like, <laughs> and I don't have headphones on, so I'm not getting the the cues that I normally get that I'm about to die. So, I. Uh, uh, well, but but what is that weapon? weapon? Oh, this is the uh, mono monocycle axe. A did, mono gear axe. Yep. Is, it, is that one? Is that one pretty rare? I'm trying to remember where it's that comes from. It's one of the apocalypse weapons. That's right. So you can right. actually craft that at the forge if you have the metalworking skill. That's I believe what it you was. can rarely find it in the sort of hidden secret prize containers around the map. And a couple of trade the, the rare weekend or the mysterious wandering trader will sell it to you. Gotcha. Okay. So, but if you're just if you're just like looting normal buildings and stuff like that, you're never going to find this. Not one. That you got to no. do something special right. to get this. But guy. if you yeah. find one of our secret orange band containers hidden in the woods somewhere. 
uh, you have a chance. Just like real life. Just like real life. You should definitely open random containers you find in the woods. Yes. <laughs> always a good decision. Always a good with idea. With no negative consequences. That's right. Yeah. Okay, well, it is 3.15, and so... Is it time? It is time. time. Let's, uh... Okay, so let's 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 give uh, a little bit of an intro to this. Get so, your, uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let, we should put our we should put our it headphones is, on. It is yeah. entirely possible that the video you're about to see is the crowning achievement of my career. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's. You know what? We've given it, given it enough intro. Let's just watch our so new yeah, here diary. Here we go. This, I love this one, by the way. It speaks to be giddy. One thing that we have to do as a part of building maps in State of Decay Two is we have to balance all the loot. Loot balance in State of Decay 2 means a lot of things. Um, the simplest <laughs> one is that the item you grab needs to make sense from the container you found it in, and it also needs to make sense for the context in which you found it. We have like 39 different loot categories and 108 different site types. And so we're gonna look at this thing which says on one side I've got all the different kinds of loot, on the other side I've got all the different places it can show up. And we have this sort of like world-class enormous Sudoku puzzle of making the right amount of stuff show up in the right places, and then it all has to make sense on a moment-to-moment -moment basis with context every time. And because we're nuts, when we go into a dread zone, we take this entire thing that we just built, right? So put in your mind this image that we have of all the data we're using and say, cool, we're gonna actually apply edits to that, that pre-loot parts of what's in the map. We're gonna take it out of the before you got there to make the game harder in deliberate and specific ways. And so every time we make a new map, we do the big old Sudoku puzzle, and then we make a giant layer on top of that that selectively pulls stuff out and then another layer that pulls stuff out further. So we've got like 12 different like grids of these 39 different types of loot with these 108 different kinds of sites to make a big old balance puzzle that we have to solve. Because on top of that, we're trying to make sure some rules are consistent, right? So we start with all this and then we go and play test this thing for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. We figure out, oh, we actually want to make sure we drop a little more of this over here, a little more of that over here. This base doesn't actually have a pharmacy nearby, so we need to put one there for meds, which means the total is going to go up. So it has to come out of this one over here, which means the nightmare preluding has to change like this. Okay, fine, here we go, let's do it again. And on and on and on we go. And then at long last, when we feel like we've got everything where we want it, off to you it goes. And that's the map. If we do it correctly, the apocalypse makes sense and it feels good with an appropriate level of challenge for your choices of where to live and how much difficulty to take on, no matter what you want to play. That was beautiful, Brian. <laughs> it's a, long, it's a long, long time in the making. <laughs> so, um... Brian has to explain <laughs> our system to me like that every day for how many years have we worked together? <laughs> It's been like four, five. No, I've been I've been here Six? seven now. I think Six seven, seven. seven in October. Wow. Yeah. But, but how long have you been on the State of Decay team with Brant? Was five of those? I think. Yeah. So. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we should probably get the game bit going again. Oh, the yeah. game. <laughs> so like when I'm when I'm looking at the game, I I see that spreadsheet. It's like it's like the Matrix in reverse. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah, instead of just looking at a bunch of code and then seeing, you know, blonde brunette, yep. you're uh, yeah, you're looking at this, running around, and you're just, the calculations are yeah, going out of the back of your there's head. There's actually a loot debugging tool that tells you why you got the stuff you got in the container you opened. And so I'll be playtesting randomly for a few hours when I can find it, and then something will be kind of wrong, and I'll have to, like, stop, open up the tool, look at the giant log of exactly how everything got there, <laughs> stare really hard at it, and make a note, and then two weeks later be like, oh, this is what it was doing, and then go and make some tweaks, and then try and like tuck that into an update in the near future. Oh, wow. I don't think I have, well, maybe I can kill it. You got a juggernaut, or? A no, like heart. In the, in the place that I wanted to uh, take over. So Mind Dragon 400 asks, uh, was one of the voice actors for the soldiers the one who voiced Marcus from State of Decay 1? The voices sound very, very similar. Uh, there, that voice does appear in our game, but it's, it's the voice of Sasquatch. The, the, the same actor who played uh, Marcus played Sasquatch from Lifeline, who Drew. is one of the radio voices who comes in over the, over the radio. So, so yeah, yeah, Drew Hobson is his name. Yep. Drew is... A longtime friend of ours. A longtime friend of the lab, and one of the sweetest people who's ever walked the face of the earth. And I, I, I hope he will always be our John Ratzenberger. Like, he'll be in everything no matter what. <laughs> I, I hope we'll we, find a way. yeah, I hope we can get him in there in one way or another, because um, he is, yeah, 
He's he's been through it with us, and no one. I don't think anybody uh, personifies un, or the state of decay like like he does. His voice. Grouchy Lamb ninety two forty six just realized that he's watching the developers of State of Decay play State of Decay. Yep. <laughs> so yes, welcome to our channel. Uh, we are the developers of State of Decay. We're three of them anyway. There's like a whole just dozens of us over there, and dozens, uh, dozens, entire dozens of people <laughs> made this game. Um, and so yeah, so we're we're just playing the game with our community, listening to questions. Uh, we've got Brian here. For those of you who don't know, he's a senior systems designer. He's in charge of loot and bases and a lot of other things that need delicate balance. He can hold more numbers in his head uh, than, than most Dude, people I, I know. Am, I am technically a banker. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not widely known. Oh, but I didn't, I didn't really, I should, I should go to you for a loan a little bit later. Um, don't go for me, guys. Go for the... My interest rates are okay. There's yeah. a, guys, why are you going for me? There's yeah, so cool fireworks have, like, in here. Nerdy balance questions you want answered no. or like, hey, why did you do no. it this way or that? Uh, go ahead. No. Shoot those questions. We'll, we'll talk about it. No. Okay, so uh, MRD Gaming asked, would it be possible to add loot to downed zombies? Oh, man, that's a... That conversation thread started before we shipped and probably never fully went to zero. Yeah. There's a lot of complicated... So the answer is probably, but there's a lot of side effects that we'd have to consider. Um, like, yeah. we do support... Like, if you find hostile humans and you defeat them, they become a zombie full of loot. Uh, but my understanding is that has a much larger sort of memory footprint. Like, it consumes a lot more of the resources on your Xbox or your PC to actually have that. And so it's actually really hard to create too many of those because we have a finite amount of characters we can manage at once. Yeah, we, yeah. Track, we track everything, yes. right? And so if we kept adding more to that list of to track, I mean... Yeah. There's, there's and there's also some, I mean, there's balance implications for you too, yeah. right? Because, like, there's a, there's a finite number of containers in the world, and so you, when you're tuning the loot tables, you've got a lot of control and a lot of knowledge about what the limits are and what you'll be able to give the player and what you won't. Right. If we if we added respawning zombies into the game who could carry loot, you know, and it, give, gets, give it gets complicated, time. right? So we, complicated. we have this concept of, like, fallback loot, which is the stuff that's so low in value, we're okay giving you nearly infinite amounts of it. We could maybe yeah. do that, but then it's not very satisfying. And it's, it's almost better not to do something if the only way for you to do it is in a way that always disappoints people. And so I, I would, I, I like the idea a lot. I like the experience it potentially creates. So far, we haven't had a, a way to frame that in the rest of the context of the game that doesn't cause more problems than it solves. But yeah. it's definitely an interesting idea. Uh, so Yukiko Davila asks, oh, were you using Excel for your spreadsheets in that video? Uh, in that video, yes. So you're probably 90, here's the way I look at it. If I have to spend a lot of time in one place looking at a very big, complicated system, and it's mostly me or a couple other people looking at it, I'll do it in Excel. And if it's something where I want a lot of people to sort of look at it and be able to use it as reference material, I might use Google Sheets because yeah. I, I like their sharing capabilities. Um, but nothing beats Excel for the sort of deep math side of things, complicated macros, um, quickly throwing visualizations together. Uh, yeah. You basically got like 20 years of feature requests from the accounting industry baked into there, and then most people <laughs> doing what I do in video games we live in this sort of gray area between things accountants have wanted and things programmers have made anyway. And we sort of use it in this totally backwards way to create data rather than to analyze data. But it's I've spent so much time in there, it's hard to imagine going somewhere else. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, as like old folks are, who are used to, you know, old, old timey programs, just the fact that it just spits out a nice little file on your drive <laughs> that you can then maybe re-import into Unreal. Uh, right. You know, there's, so there's several that's, things that's that I use Excel for yeah. because of that nice, simple, familiar workflow. Yeah. There's a specific thing I like in that Unreal has a concept called a data table, which is sort of an in-engine data format to consume okay. sort of spreadsheet, spreadsheet shaped use. stuff. Um, Excel has a secret developer tab that you can unhide. Uh, and once you do that, you can actually crack open uh, what's called VBA scripting, and you can actually write code inside of Excel and then attach that code to a button in the spreadsheet. Uh, the first thing you saw in that trailer was my boot up the loop flow code, which is just like super simple. It just opens a bunch of files and makes sure that they're all something I can check out and edit so I don't wind up saving my work. And then it turns out that three of those files were in use. And so now I've got half the stuff correct and half the stuff not correct. So Excel gives me a lot of tools to sort of automate my process a little bit, make some extra safeguards. You can also save pieces of a spreadsheet as a CSV, and then Excel can natively import CSVs. So sometimes the spreadsheet can go almost straight into the game. Uh, having worked in the industry long enough, plenty of places don't really give you that kind of workflow, but you wind up needing to use a spreadsheet to do your balance anyway. And so then it just becomes really tedious to like replicate all your work. So being able to do the work close to one time, if not just one time, is really powerful for integration, which yeah. I value a lot. And so, yeah, so I end up using Excel for the buff spreadsheet and yep. for the cultural background spreadsheet, and you use it for much bigger and more complicated things than, than I would ever want to wrap my head around. And Brian doesn't let me anywhere near spreadsheets. It's not like he wants to. I can leave it up on my screen if I need him to sort of just shy away. 
Uh, okay, so we got a couple of fairly uh, straightforward questions. Sure. Uh, FR96 asks, will retired bounty weapons be added to the loot drop in the future? Uh, our plan is actually to bring them back to the bounty broker in the future. And so uh, the, the problem is that when a weapon is available from the bounty broker, we can't put it in loot because uh, it's actually being gated behind you having completed that bounty. Um, and so if you got it from loot, you wouldn't be able to interact with it or take it because it's a bounty weapon. Um, and so uh, our plan for bringing those back is for uh, the bounty broker to keep cycling and keep bringing back old packs. And so eventually, you know, the, the packs that, that have gone away will come back again, or at least the weapons from them uh, can and will. And that, so that's our plan for that. Yeah. Um, and so Hellhound wants to know, can you only find some outfits on a certain map? There are a few outfits that exclusively drop on certain maps, and I believe that information is in the closet entry for those items? Yeah, if, if the closet entry does not say this is only available on a certain map, then it should be available on any map. Right. Um, but there's like, I think it's specifically leather jackets. The colorful leather jackets are the ones that are, are map specific. It's, it's exceptionally few articles of clothing in the context of the whole collection have that behavior. I mean, who knows? If you watch this video a year from now, maybe we've added more, but right now, yeah, as, exactly. of, as of the 10th of February, 2020, there's only like three or something like that. Yeah. And, yep. yeah. no, the, the first tab in that spreadsheet is the change list. Yeah. <laughs> so Fresh Dope asks, Fresh Dope Games asks, how do you determine what is climbed on? Um, yeah, Brant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, originally, yeah. it's everything. And so you, we have to um, create what we call markup in Maya, which is the 3D program we use for, for um, creating the props. Um, and then um, you have to... You have to isolate the edges that you want to be able to be climbable. So that's why some things with really rough outlines like the crashed uh, semi-truck have some weird, sometimes you pop through the hood or something like that. Um, but you have to mark all these edges, each edge at a time, um, or else you create a box if it's a pretty simple object like that wall. Um, and then put it in the game, play it, and wait for the level designer or the level artist to, to put props that have markup on them in strange combinations that <laughs> that uh, make it so you have to then go in and edit what is and what is not climbable. Um, Would you say that a lot of your sort of the bug fixing phase of your work involves finding out about those those weird collisions and having to... to... A huge <laughs> amount. Mark, Undead Mark also has to deal with that because he does, um, he does all the windows and like buildings stuff that's and, in yeah. buildings and... It's simple when when it's by itself, when it's a prop by itself. You see, you look at the markup, it's working, you're great. But then when you start putting it in combination with things, pretty soon you have guys, you know, uh, t basically smashing into walls and stuff like that or getting places that they're not supposed to be. So side by side, you'll see things that have, um, that should be climbable and one is and one isn't. Sometimes it's because the system has negated the climb up on certain edges because there's, it's really weird. But yeah, do we have the the debug stuff set up where we could show people? Like, I don't want. No, no, I don't no, want to show people. This is a, this no, is a retail no, building. It, it, oh, tur it turns into spaghetti nightmare when you turn <laughs> oh, on the markup debug, and it also slows the system down to nothing. I guess you guys have seen behind the curtain enough for one day. <laughs> it's, yeah. um, I could I could see us like at some time in the future when we decide that that's what we want to do, sure. setting up specifically for it. But yeah, no worries. It's I mean in short, there's we have some inconsistencies because. Um, Often we just had to take markup off of things. Like here's a good example. This, oh, that happened all the time. Yeah, this banister used to have markup on it, but you're sprinting through your house a lot just to get things done, and markup senses if you're close and if you're sprinting, it'll force you to go over things. Like so often you'd be running to the kitchen and you'd end up downstairs because <laughs> that's what markup does. It reaches out and grabs you. So if you've so. ever broken a window. Uh, this is cool. You could accidentally defenestrate yourself <laughs> by sprinting into a window before we fixed the markup issues back in the day. Yeah, and it wasn't, I think, was it Was it last week or at some point, somebody was telling, uh, was asked about their favorite bug, and they mentioned the fact that, that it used to be that uh, NPCs would jump out of windows, uh, specifically yep. if you exiled them while you were upstairs. Oh, because they're, they're trying, <laughs> they're, they're following the path of least resistance outside the base, and yeah. the markup system yeah. says, you could just jump. Yeah, so there's like, so they did. Like, like oh. I'm so I'm so depressed that you guys let me Screw go. This place. Yeah, jumps right out the window. So mean. Yeah. Um, I got another question here. 
Oh, okay, so this one's kind of, I think, more my wheelhouse. Uh, Ranoth Court asks, um, in Heartland, the timers between missions are set to really precise lengths, but in the main game, the timers between legacy missions are much more variable. Want to talk about how those decisions were made? Um, so I think Leah actually understands that stuff better than I do. We should have her on the stream one of these days to, to be able to get into, into more detail she's about that stuff. She's great to have on stream anyway. Yeah, so she's also, know. yeah, just really fun. Uh, but, uh, but her, yeah, her, anyway, point is, uh, yeah, they do work differently, and, and the reason why um, our missions are kind of unpredictable is because sort of the, the underlying goal of a mission system was uh, to, to have missions be sort of unpredictable and different every time you play through the game. And so they have this, this idea called casting, which is, you know, they, they, each mission, we don't say, you know, we don't name specific characters and specific sequence of events, specific locations and specific routes. Instead, the game reaches out and, and it basically the mission says, I'm looking for a building kind of like this. I'm looking for another building that is sort of this distance away. And I need um, an enclave that has this many people uh, and this one, uh, you know, is, is going to be our protagonist, and this one is going to be the person they have to rescue. And it's, but it doesn't name any of those characters. It just says we need people like this. And then the game looks out into your world and tries to find matching circumstances. It tries to find a good building that matches uh, what's going on. It tries to find an enclave and a character that it can use. It and tries really hard. It tries really, really it's, hard, it but it fails a lot. In fact, in the background, you're, you, the game is constantly trying to find uh, occasions to give you missions and is very frequently failing. And the times when missions actually pop up is when it succeeds. Um, and so when we've got our, our legacy missions, we've definitely predefined certain set you know, amounts of time between them to make sure that there are gaps and you get time to sort of relax before you start shoving the next mission at you. But then there's just a lot of variability because, you know, the question is how often does this mission check to see if it can cast? How precise is it about, you know, exactly how does it need to cast? How many detailed things does it need before it will work? And it will just keep failing until it finds uh, the right circumstances uh, to work. And so it's, it's so complex under the surface um, that it, it makes it actually very difficult for us to make certain things happen in certain ways. In fact, we had to kind of really undermine that system to make Heartland work because Heartland needed to have certain things happen at very specific times. And that was actually one of the challenges. That sounds like it's a simpler setup, but because we built our entire system to be um, expanded expecting a lot of randomness and expecting a lot of unpredictability, um, trying to do it in a very locked down and precise way was actually much harder uh, with our tools than doing a bunch of random stuff. So that's kind of the thinking. I don't know if that's exactly the answer you're looking for, but that's kind of the thinking and the, and the, the infrastructure behind it. I'm riding a tricycle. Oh, I was. Oh, man, that was really good. You were definitely going for a ride. <laughs> The real Peel One, uh, one of our one of our favorite folks, says that he loves Heartland, and we appreciate the <laughs> the positive sentiment. It makes us feel good. Thank you for sharing that. And Big Lou says, hearing explanations like that, uh, like I think each of us has got a chance to give yeah. big, elaborate explanations of something. Please give us more excuses to like <laughs> opine about these deep systems that we've been working in for all these years. Yeah, but, but Big Lou says this is why he comes to the stream, and this is why we come too. We want to be yeah. able to do, like don't, our yeah. Go ahead. I'm gonna just say, don't ever ask me about markup again because <laughs> I've spent. <laughs> A lot of money on therapy, trying to <laughs> forget everything about markup. <laughs> uh, so what's going on in the game right now, Brant? I am being as <laughs> as careful as I can. <laughs> so it's going to be the most boring like gameplay stream. You should probably just put it in one of the small boxes because uh, I am just creeping along. I am the worst nightmare player ever. So Monadax asks, uh, who creates the zombie sounds? So we've got an audio team, uh, a really good, Very like top-notch audio, audio team. team. Uh, there's, there's, I think there's four guys, um, and they, uh, is it, did I count them properly? Yes, I believe there's four of them. Yes. And <laughs> One, two, three. Four. Yeah, yeah, four. yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, we've had them on the stream before. Actually, if you look back at our old YouTube videos, uh, we've ha we've had one or two uh, uh, discussions that were specifically bringing the audio team in here to talk about their work and 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 how everything works. And we should have them back again. Uh, you know, I think it's been it's been since last year uh, sometime. Of course, it's easy for things to be last year because that's only like four streams ago. Yep. But <laughs> it was like early last year, the last time we had one of them on, I think. So uh, we should have them back because yeah, the, learning about their work, which it's really easy to ignore when they're doing their job right. It it means it just feels like the world, yep. and you're not thinking about the audio. We have a lot of work goes into it to make it that way. We we truly do have what should be an award-winning audio team um, between the music and the sounds. Uh, to answer your question specifically, all zombies, with very few exceptions, are Kevin, our audio director. He would like eat yogurt and then try and scream through it and 
probably hurt himself permanently doing all these gross voices. I know that we did a, there was a, I think as part of the Heartland Dev Diary set, we showed off how we made the Blood Plague sounds. I think they had like a soldering iron in a little cup of water. And they oh, would yeah, intentionally right. like drown, like you, you break soldering irons this way. And so they just bought cheap ones and just like ruined them in water to record the sound of the sort of ferocious bubbling it made. And then like transform that to create the sort of like blood bubble fizzy thing that happens with the plague zombies. I think that we might have included that in our last interview with one of them on the stream. Uh, Alex. When Alex came was, on? Yeah. He is a master. That's his like fully artistry. Going out and finding those things. Like he he was the guy who drove up to um, central Washington and recorded the um, the uh, windmill uh, oh, generators. right. The, 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 uh, the, yeah, the background audio for having yeah. windmills around. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because remember after we did that, there were some conversations in house where someone's like, I think these are rotating a little slow. I'm going to speed them up. And the audio guys were like, no, 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 I'm not going back. Yeah. We did this once. Yeah. So, now, okay, we're. Go no, you go ahead. Well, the, the thing that impressed me the most about the audio in our game, setting aside the quality of all of it, is that there is a dynamic system that is trying to figure out how scared you should be. And then dynamically adjusting the music based on like an underlying threat scoring system. And like I've done scoring systems before, it's really easy for those to sometimes go off the rails and it's hard to un understand why. No one complains about it because it's really good. <laughs> it's exactly the sort of thing that when it's doing its best, no one notices it's there. And I have just all the respect for them that they managed to get that to be as performant and consistent as it is. It's one of my favorite little details. So we're about halfway through the stream. In fact, we're a little more than halfway. So I should remind you about a couple of things that are going on. First off, we're giving away this t-shirt. This is the last of its kind. It is a large. Uh, bear that in mind when you're entering to receive it. But if you want to receive this t-shirt, you gotta type this into the chat. Exclamation point, enter. Type that in. Uh, you'll be entered into a drawing. And uh, we got about 10 minutes left before we're gonna do the actual drawing and reward somebody. We should also point out, in case they showed up, um, Will Roscoe 25 they were our winner last week, and they... They won this t-shirt, which is also one of its kind. But they uh, need to get a hold of us. They need We'd to like to know us. where you are. Social at undeadlabs.com is our email address. They need to find us, because if they want to actually get their t-shirt, we need to get in contact with them. If they don't do it before the next stream, this will be up for grabs again, and we'll give it to somebody else. So let me know about that. And also, in case you were curious, one of the best ways uh, to get information about upcoming uh, Xbox games um, is it's Major, Major Nelson's show. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's called uh, This Week on Xbox. Uh, I think if you go to any whatever channel you're watching us on, if you do that channel slash Xbox, that's the channel it's going to be on. It's 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time on Fridays. Uh, we're going to be watching it specifically this Friday. Uh, we're really excited for it. So think you might be interested in it too. That's right. But we're for right now, yeah, we're going to be watching. Yeah, very, we're going to be times. watching. We're gonna be watching it real hard. Uh, so anyway, uh, so wanted you to know that in, in case that ends up being useful information for you. But right now, what we've got is Brian Giami. He's a systems. Uh, he's a senior systems designer. Yep. He's here answering questions about loot and base facilities and all of these, you know, these complicated systems that, that he's in charge of. Let's see, uh, ASRB Gaming asks a question, saying, based on the values in the spreadsheets, if we looted everything clothing-wise and special weapon-wise, how often will we get blank searches? So. There is a baseline chance for you to get an empty container in the game. Uh, it's the apocalypse. You're not the only ones who've been searching for supplies. Occasionally, you'll get a dud. Uh, that number is roughly 10%. Um, as you start to loot more of the map, we do sort of simulate the, the water eventually runs out of the bucket. Oh, there. You start to run a little bit dry, and so you'll get a few more chances to get nothing. Uh, if you exhaust all the loot from one category out of the map, then there's a chance to find nothing there. But more often than not, we'll do what's called put fallback loot in it, which is why if you play the map for a while, you'll suddenly see a preponderance of bandages, snacks, and parts. Because those tend to be the things that we w we'd rather give you a little something than literally nothing, just so it doesn't feel like your time wasn't worthwhile. Yeah. But we do have to try and give you stuff that is not as powerful as the stuff that you got when you found those sort of like untouched, pristine sites where you went looting for the first time. Uh, so Ryan Price asks, is there a limit of items you can have within your locker for your community? <laughs> Currently, I have a massive stockpile of every ammo type, and I'm wondering when I'll hit a wall. Okay, I knew the answer to this maybe three years ago, because I remember talking to Matthew <laughs> Bozarth about it. Because at one point, there was a limit, and it caused so many problems, we decided to try and make one without a limit. But uh, that's, a, that's a false sentence. Engineering-wise, you can't code a thing that doesn't have a limit unless you're prepared to let it crash the game from using up all your memory. 
It's something like 9999 distinct stacks of item, I think. Yeah, it's some arbitrarily high value that is so high. If you get there, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Magic man sitting there like... He's like, I'll get there, I'm almost there. No, no, he's... He's he's broken our economy exactly. so hard. So the, the hope was that most players would never encounter that limit. It should feel limitless. But practically speaking, if we actually made it limitless, you could crash your Xbox or your PC. So it's not actually limitless. Uh, Fabian907 asks, will you ever increase the dialogue that is spoken in the world to make it feel lively when away from base? So adding brand new dialogue is actually one of the most expensive things we can do because uh, we have 14 different voices and we never know which one you're going to be playing. And so every piece of dialogue has to be recorded by 14 different actors, which is very, very uh, time consuming and difficult. So adding new dialogue is difficult, but at the same time, we actually recorded a lot more dialogue than we're using. Um, and so we do have a sort of a, a, a hit list of lines that were recorded for the game that were never implemented. And so at some point in the future, I would love for us to go back in and try to see if we can implement a few more of those uh, to get them into the game. Because right now they're just sort of sitting there and used like we recorded them, but we never actually got around to that part of the feature <laughs> that would trigger the line uh, actually being spoken. So I don't know uh, how much life that would necessarily add what you know they might be for mostly for very rare cases which means you would still you know you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily feel a huge difference difference from them but the more the characters can comment on i agree with you uh that it does make them feel more alive and responsive oh interesting so a uh, mind dragon 400 asks as game developers yourselves when you play a game do you make mental notes on systems they use example if a game has a poor loot generation system or experience experience system do you learn from that I have not been able to turn that switch off yeah. for five years. <laughs> it's just yeah. the world I see now. Constant. It's, You're it's constantly. unceasing. Yeah. Like we will actually have times where we're playing a game and somebody will say, like this happened like Metal Gear Solid Five, I believe, because they do a bunch of really cool AI sandbox stuff, and a bunch of us were talking about it, and eventually we decided we needed to play it in the shop, and so we had twelve people hanging out behind a TV, all taking notes as we were like trying to figure out like their character pivots and like how they're aim interactions work because they do the weird thing where if you're shooting but you're next to a rock the bullets come from the gun which means you can miss what's in the middle of the screen so they move the crosshair onto the rock and all this like weird stuff but also like, the way that their progression systems works were super weird you could like find the gunsmith 30 hours in and unlock a modding system you didn't know was there and so it's a cool system but like how you get it is completely arcane and so like that was a moment i remember we were all like everybody was fixated on what they were learning from the game and like nobody was actually just talking about how much they liked it because we were so overwhelmed by just like studying the thing. And so there's this like ebb and flow of that for us where you look at a game and you want to understand how is it doing this? Why is it doing this? What was their goal with this? And then like two years later, you'll get a GDC talk that actually answers those questions and like half of your theories were just completely wrong. But some of your theories actually might lead you to to, to ideas that were also just good in their own right, oh, yeah, right? you get inspired by what other people do all the time, right? Every every yeah. game ever made like stands on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, one of my favorite things is, is to just sort of blast through one indie game after another and just see the weird stuff that people are doing. Like, yep. I mean, like if, I, I would say you know go, going to like rockpapershotgun.com is a great place to find out about like weird indie games that are coming out on PC. Uh, IndieGamesPlus.com is another place. Uh, I, I'm constantly mining those for for um, for you know finding out about about new games to try. And th there's a lot of just really interesting work being done out there. I just uh, finished, uh, you know, not, not just finished my like my first run of this game called Nowhere Profit, which is like yeah, Slay gotta, the Spire. I gotta check this one out. I have been buried in Slay the Spire for like a month. <laughs> Um, Which is it's a very I different kind of the game. Spire yet. It, it's a very different. I've, uh, yeah, it's a very different kind of game from our game. Yeah. But there are still you know all these lessons you can learn about you know uh, just like uh, card based games for instance. They give you abilities. They don't like sort of slowly level up a percentage. They hand you things in big yeah. chunks, new yep. powers, and, and that it, it's such a, a, a compelling experience. Not to just get a stat rising a little bit, but just get a completely brand new thing you can. It's really with. it's better at number based systems to giving you the sort of moments of like oh, now I can do this. Whereas yeah. if it's a number going up over time, like you basically need to keep artificially juicing that number to make it feel as good as it does when it goes up. Yeah. And every number based progression system eventually becomes a game where you don't care. Yeah. One like, of the th yeah. Go ahead. Oh, see, one of the things we learned uh, when we were developing our skill system was that uh, you know the, the the skill system in State of K one would unlock certain things as you progressed you know star by star through the skill, but. Uh, it was really easy just to miss that that had happened, you right. know, because you, your character is leveling up passively in the background while you're playing. It's really easy just to not notice when something happens. And so we, that's why we ended up sort of creating those skill specializations where we would create like a moment halfway through your development of a skill where your skill fundamentally changes and you make a choice and that's when you get most of your new abilities. Yep. And then similarly when you max it out you can get a few more, but that moment where you're specializing gives us a chance to say the player will definitely notice that something changed and pick it up. It's kind of like getting a new card. Now I remember, um, 
I was talking a week or two ago about uh, Oblivion, because oh. they did a super weird thing for your skills in that game, mm -hmm. where you would acquire points, but you couldn't spend them until you went to sleep. And so you'd oh, be passively yeah. getting stuff, and then until you actually like sort of called it a night, they would sort of switch over to this whole full screen thing where they're like, and how do you want to spend all of that? And I remember when I played it some number of years ago, I was like, that's weird. When I play it in the modern context, I'm like, oh, this makes me actually realize that this all happened and think about where I want to spend my points. That actually feels really clever now. Yeah. Uh, so it is 3.44. Oh, so I think that Megan is about to shut down uh, the enters, entrances as... Enterings? What do we call these things? When you enter a contest. Entries? Entries. Entries. She's about to shut down the entries. So if you get if you want to get your like exclamation point enter in there at the very last second, maybe you've got some time or maybe she's already stopped it. I don't know. But if you want a t-shirt, last chance. It's about to go away. Whew. Alright. Hmm. Oh, I don't like nightmare. So uh, Mad Weasel asks, what is the one thing you're most proud of on SOD? There's so many pieces. I can't. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I can't. The, limit the, it. the the sheer complexity of it is the the thing that's challenging of, about it. Trying to make all these systems work together to kind of cre to, to kind of create the the zombie survival fantasy. Yep. It's like that fantasy touches so many things. It's about surviving hand to hand against zombies. It's also about you know building your community. It's also about worrying about resources. It's also about you know driving around in a big world that feels curiously empty and peaceful. Right. And like meeting people with skills and backgrounds you didn't expect, and then having them contribute. All some badass things to your survival experience that you never knew were like, like oh, a sleep psychologist, you're useless, right? Yeah. Uh, no, actually being able to sleep really makes a difference when there's constantly death everywhere around you. Any ability to get more rest means you can like survive long enough to run the extra mile to pick up the bag of food you need to not die. Yeah, and, and like creating unexpected little moments like that that pay off real people's stories that we've heard over the years is deeply gratifying. I think possibly the one that was most fun for me to work with was the character generation system. Like you were saying, you know, trying to come up with the, the massive array of different traits that give characters sort of backstories. And when you sort of pour three of these traits together, it's sort of, they, they come together and you're like, try to imagine what the life oh, of this boy. person was and has to get to give them these weird traits. Uh, that was probably my favorite thing to work on though. I know, I think I learned the most from uh, doing the naming system yeah. because I had to find out how people get named in like, all these two dozen cultures. different cultures. Uh, yeah, there's. Uh, I should do. We should do an entire stream about it sometime. Uh, I think I can definitely look at like the loot and the and the guns. Probably are two big ones. The fact that the loot can, like has to have as many masters as it does and pays all the other systems off appropriately. Yeah, oh and like seems. To, I mean, there's sure everything else grows out of that. They know when anything is wrong, but the, the the feedback is usually, hey, why did I get parts out of this container like one time? <laughs> and like what that saying means, a hundred other things are fine, and this one thing can sometimes be a problem. Uh, but also the fact that, you know, one of the main reasons that we, we tend to do as many farms as we do is that we manage to make that pretty straightforward. Yeah. And so that system allows you to, like, hierarchically balance all the 9mm guns at the same time or all the 5.56 weapons at the same time or all the rifles in a way that gives you pretty good control over what you're tuning. And so we managed to get it to be pretty straightforward to work on that. And as a result, we can sort of put out more content that way. And so that's also, like, a sign of success in my view, that it's easy to keep making more stuff in that vein. Mm -hmm. So we do have a winner uh, for our giveaway. So... This beautiful red t-shirt, this T-Rex Presso t-shirt, one of its kind, large size, is going to be going to Curative Fur 7834. I believe they're on Mixer. Uh, congratulations, Curative Fur. You did it. And uh, so what you want to do is, uh, if, if, if uh, Megan doesn't find a way to get in contact with you, you definitely want to send her an email at social at undeadlabs.com. So do that. You don't want to be left behind like, Ro uh, like uh, Roscoe. You want to get this shirt, so definitely make sure you get in contact with Megan. Oh yeah, so it looks like uh, Joe actually uh, has uh, sent a message, so hopefully that's going to work out, and that t-shirt's going to go to Curative Fur. We are excited for you and jealous because we don't get the shirt. Yep. <laughs> so uh, we've got about 12 minutes left, so if you guys have any you know, last minute questions, uh, especially for Brian, we'd love to hear them. Yeah, I don't... This isn't going to be a very exciting because I'm stuck on a roof and apparently I live here now. Yeah, so what we did in a nightmare is uh, if the zombies can't, we always had this behavior where if the zombie can't see you, it'll yell. And we, uh, we you know, we, before Nightmare and Dread came out, this was sort of a way to, it felt almost like an exploit, like we hadn't really thought about it. And what that meant was it wasn't really tuned to be super punishing if you did it. What we did in Dread of Nightmare is we found that exact spot in the scripting where it tells the zombie to yell and just doubled the volume of that screen. <laughs> and so what that does is, and like I think people are asking a little bit about like you know swarm simulation. This is actually an example of that, where the zombies will scream and other zombies will hear them, and then those zombies can't see you, and then those zombies will scream, and so they will like slowly attract all the zombies in the region to the rooftop where Brant is currently stranded, 
<laughs> and you'll just be surrounded by terror. So it'll get worse and worse. You're making your problem, your long, your short-term problem, you've solved. Right. You're, you can't be reached. Your long-term problem gets worse over exactly. time. Exactly. Which felt very on brand for the apocalypse. <laughs> it's too bad I don't have like I don't know an airstrike or something. But you sure? I don't. So uh, DSync was also kind of curious about the experience of clearing an area of zombies and then wanting it, you know, maybe to take a little bit longer for, for zombies to come back. So, you know, Jeffrey sort of, that we buried the lead on this one. Uh, been thinking a lot about that recently. We've got some research stuff that we're playing with right now. The game right now has the sort of underlying philosophical level for the spawn that's fairly arcadey, where we want to make sure that you have enough combat going so you don't get too bored. Um, it is my view at this point, and I think a few of us share this after a couple years of looking at the game, that oh my it's God. better to have <laughs> moments of quiet and peace and then punctuated moments of, of sort of terror, like Rancid like this one? right now. Yes. Um, in my view, this is probably too steady that we do this, where it's just sort of always going, going, going. I'd rather have there be like moments of relative quiet. And so we're like tinkering behind the scenes to see what we can do. Oh, but stuff is very important to us that we create a deliberate simulation experience, but that it also go, go, makes go, go, you not get to stranded in a completely empty area for too long, or that you're literally swimming through an ocean of zombies that never ends. Yeah, so basically this, it's very easy for us to fall off a cliff one direction, and the world always feels empty. Right. And it's easy to fall off the cliff on the other direction, and there's just zombies on you all the time. Right. And so I think we knew that you know we weren't going to get it exactly perfectly the first time we tried it, and so we erred on the side of there's zombies on you all the time, yeah. because that's kind of exciting, but yeah, like figuring out now that we've got a system that works. And Playing your own game is one of the best things you can do to try to improve it because once you can see it and you play it for a long time, you realize, okay, the balance is a little bit more Hello. on this direction. Let's see if we can pull it back. Look who was waiting tweets. for me. Oh, Look at that guy. Oh, buddy. Oh, oh, I shot him with a shotgun. He's like, I got to your house before you did. You just had me waiting outside, man. I'm not happy about that. Oh, man. Come on. All the pellets are just going into his shoulders. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> This is a great I, way to end the stream, Brent. I don't want to do it this uh, way. He'll, he'll make Brent, it. you are a consummate He'll be entertainer. Fine. He'll get it. He'll get it. <laughs> nice. Oh, take that, yes. you jerk. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to let my other guys help me out. Please. By the way, uh, Jerzyo says that you are very well spoken, Brian. And that is a that is a nice compliment because he's one of my favorite YouTubers that, that covers oh, Stadium Care, too. We're all fans of our content creators in the community. You all do a. <laughs> uh, it, it is deeply gratifying to see somebody else engage in your game enough to want to tell others about it. Like, the, the main reason that anybody making games makes games and doesn't do something else is usually because we love this and we love making things for people. Mm -hmm. And there's, like, nothing more satisfying than have them talk about how much they liked it. Like, it's just, yeah. it gets us up in the morning. So thank you. Yeah, one of the things that I really like about Jerzyo's channel is that when we do a stream where we're actually revealing a bunch of stuff, we spend an hour going into, like, really fine detail about all of it, and then he takes a couple of clips and does a 10-minute video, yep. distilling it all down. You Great. get everything that you need. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, Jersey with a zero on the end, and it's spelled weird. Uh, so <laughs> J-U-R-Z-Y-0. Yeah. Give, give him a look. Yeah, so I, I really like his stuff. So, so feel free to check that out. Yeah. And I can, I'm betting that clip ends up on his show. <laughs> good, good. I'm just trying to get on your show, Jersey. That's all I'm doing. I just want to have them, I want everyone who likes us to be more successful. Just <laughs> yeah. rising tide, raise all boats. Keep it Exactly. Um, right, We've got, uh, we got more questions for the eight minutes we have left. Oh, do we? Let's say, let's see. I've been losing track. <laughs> so, a, li a little man wants us to add an RV, RV with vehicle. 20 storage. Oh, only, one from, only one for map, and it's messed up. It has 20 storage. The problem with that is we would have to make a new UI element because our UI element yeah, it literally doesn't fit. I don't think it even. It's scrolls. got exactly enough room for nine slots. Yeah. And we Ship just shipping games is hard. We just upgraded the van, so the van, uh, so the apocalypse van, the Vandito, has, the Vandito has God, nine slots. That, so that is our first nine slot vehicle, and it is maxing it out. We'd have to build something brand new if we wanted to do any more. So, Just Kempster says it would be cool if you could have more than one base. That's another thing that would take a lot of UI yeah, revision no, for us like, to do. We'd have to crack open so many things that we haven't touched in years. Our, probably one of the most complicated things in the game is our base screen. We had a programmer working on nothing but that yep. for a really long time, yep. and it still is, you know, we would love to have it have more features uh, than it currently has. And yeah. so, duplicating that, so you have two bases at once. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge for us is always oh. that you want to make sure the game that you're con the game that exists live should be something new players can get into. And like, there's always this trap for games that are in like a live service mode where you can keep adding complexity and adding features for your existing audience. But every time you do that, you push the needle a little bit further away from new players being able to learn it. So like, if you try and go and play like Quake now. <laughs> like the 80 people, there's probably more than 80, the, the people who currently play that game, and there are still some, are so impossibly good at it. They've developed such a mastery over it, it's impenetrable to new players. 
And so there's this idea with a live service game that you want to try and make sure that people can come in and enjoy what you've made mm -hmm. without seeing so much stuff. They're just like, ah, I don't know what's going on. But then you also have enough there with enough new stuff coming out at the right cadence that your expert players can look at it and go, oh, cool, yeah, this is, I want to stick with this game. I want this to be my hobby. Yeah. And so we always have to try and hit a balance between how much new stuff, how different is the new stuff, how much more complicated does this make the game, and can we explain this? And so we have to apply that every time we talk about new features. Yeah, totally. Um, and I should say, by the way, for those of you on YouTube who interpret every time we say the word live service to mean we're talking about gouging players. Uh, <laughs> that, that just means we put out updates, man. Yeah, all that means to us when we say that word, all we're talking about is the fact that this game right now is being updated regularly despite the fact that it came out like two years ago. Yeah. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Just wanted, know, before, before we have clips of this video on a bunch of different YouTube channels, just wanted to say that out loud. Yeah. We're just talking about the fact that this game is getting updates regularly and we're it's continuing to support it long after release. What else we got? Oh, let's see here. Huh, Fory Boy asks, uh, will you ever bring back the traps for the outposts? So they work so differently now than in State of Decay 1, we'd have to come up with something that's ultimately new. Um, in State of Decay 1, every time a horde existed, it existed because it was coming to your base to attack you. In this game, we actually simulate them kind of the way we do as zombies. Mm -hmm. And so there's like an AI manager entity for each zombie, and there's one for a horde of zombies and it behaves like an enemy where if one zombie hears you, the whole horde goes. Instead of the K1, they were completely different. They only existed as little base attacks that you could stop them in their tracks. And so, so that, that, that like tower defense mechanic where you would try to place the traps in places to keep the hordes from getting to your base was really meaningful in State of Decay 1, and it wouldn't be meaningful in the same way. Yeah. Like if we wanted to do that, it would be solving a different problem, and we'd have to think really in depth about like what does it actually mean to do this, and it would have to compete with all the other stuff that players have talked about wanting, all the other stuff that we could be doing with our time. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I think getting the feedback that folks, that folks miss that feature and they wanted to have a little bit more of a strategic experience playing on the map, totally get that. And I think that makes a lot of sense and it's good to hear that from you folks because as we continue to develop this franchise, that's a piece of data that's going to inform the decisions that we make in the future. And that doesn't necessarily mean that that specific change is one that we'll go and put in State of Decay 2 right now. Uh, because sometimes, it, like, you know, when, when you get feedback from, from, from an audience, what you have to do is, is think, okay, what is the experience they're looking for? What bad experience did they have or good experience they've had in, in other games that they're, that they're really looking oh, for? Crap. And what's the best way for us to give it, give it to no, them? No, don't get stuck in a chair. And the answer isn't always to do exactly what the the most obvious thing. Sometimes it means you got to, you know, kind of be clever and come up with a solution that sort of, uh, sort of, I don't know, takes care of, of, of all of the different competing concerns, uh, which isn't necessarily always do the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, Bill Rahal says, what about a secondary holster? The ability to quickly change to a handgun. That's one of my personal top favorite. I mean, that was actually in the original design document that we wrote up. Yep. And, uh, you know, it, it's a feature that, that we ended up, you know, sort of cutting from our plans because we wanted, you know, the game to arrive. Uh, but uh, that, that, that's a personal favorite of mine. I would love to get that in at some point. Me so, too. Yeah. There are definitely some players where if you watch them streaming, they will rapidly inventory button mash and like switch guns on the fly, which is very impressive, but also far more involved than a trivia if we were going to have that as a first class feature. Quick uh, comment before we go from Gemini Genius. Cooking skill needs a boost. So this is th interesting. So yeah. I've been talking about this one. Some players tell me it's the only thing they use for morale because uh, if you have excess food, you can cook feasts and you can keep that number really high for a good long time. Um, there's certainly, I mean, like somebody else mentioned, like plumbing earlier, and there's certainly some opportunities to make like that more useful. Mm -hmm. uh, my under, I, I, we should go look at the data at some point. I feel like I could keep doing a little bit more with cooking, but I think that there are other things that want that love first. One thing that, that Brian and I have been doing uh, a lot, which is. It, Brian's the imp impetus behind this, is looking at our data to specifically pinpoint pieces of content or parts of systems that are underused. Because that seems like an indicator that the players at large have judged that thing as being not very valuable, and it can inform our decisions about balance. We, when you, we can realize that, for instance, the Wichita was a car that nobody wanted, uh, which is why we upgraded its cargo capacity to make it more valuable. And then we're going to look back at the data and see if people were more interested in it after we made the change. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a big, you know, you used to just kind of have to make up a lot of your decisions about game balance and hope that they were going to work. But the fact that we can sort of collect data on what's actually working in the field and what's not gives us a huge advantage to, you know, to trying to figure out what's, uh, how to change the game to, to make it more attractive. If the game only has one good thing in a category that everyone wants and no one wants the other things, then it feels like we've done something wrong. <laughs> and so we need to be looking for answers. And sometimes it'll take us multiple iterations to get the right balance wow, down, but, uh, but we're paying attention. And, and, and the way that you play actually directly informs uh, the way that we respond. Yep. 
Well, it's 3.59, so we should probably get out of here. Uh, one thing, just one last thing we should mention, aside from, actually, the last thing we should say, uh, the second to last thing we should say is, Thank you, Brian, for coming in here and talking to us. Sure. And, for, and also just for the fact that, uh, I mean, you lent your expertise to this game, and it's it's a unique expertise that literally no one else at the, at the studio has. And this game would not be what it is without you. So we're really grateful, grateful to have you on the team. And thanks for coming and telling everybody what you do. That was entirely too kind that I have no idea how to respond. Now <laughs> get back to your cage. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing we should say is, if you folks are looking for great information about upcoming Xbox games, upcoming updates to Xbox games. Uh, Major Nelson's show, uh, This Week on Xbox. Uh, if, you know, whatever channel you're on, you go to that slash Xbox. That's the channel it is. Uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time on Fridays is when it comes out. We're planning on watching uh, this week's episode, and uh, we think you guys might be interested in it, too. I know what I'll be doing at 9 a.m. Pacific time. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> on Friday. Indeed, we all. Exactly. We all know what we're doing at 9 so, Pacific time. So it's 4 o'clock. We will leave you folks with that, and uh, we'll get out of here. Bye, everybody. Thanks. We Thanks love for spending you. your time with us. We appreciate y'all. We love you. Heart. And we love this week on Xbox, Fridays dude, at 9 a.m. <laughs> is this the part where we start talking about secrets, and then you hit the cancel button in the middle of the sentence where I'm talking?